welcome everybody uh, to the Berkeley Postdoc Entrepreneurship Workshop. Today, we are talking about the psychology of deep tech startup founders. How do you muster courage to launch a startup? Uh, because a lot of researchers think about it, but it stays as an idea. So we thought, let, let's talk to people who have gone through this multiple times. And, and Doug, who sees hundreds of companies go through this, and I'm sure he has a lot to share on this subject. Uh, but before we jump in, we just want to tell people what the Berkeley Postdoc Entrepreneurship Program is all about. We, we are starting the 11th year, uh, and this has been a, a fun ride. We have about 25, 30 companies, all deep tech, that are still surviving. These are technologies that came from research at UC Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, translated to startup companies. Uh, that's what we try to do. We create an entrepreneurship spirit uh, amongst postdocs and grad students at UC Berkeley and helping them translate the research. We help them engage in that discussions uh, in, in friendly fire. They come to some of our workshops and they come and pitch like, hey, I'm thinking about this startup. This is my research. What do you guys think? You know, they get feedback, form companies. Uh, it innovate, energizes the ecosystem at UC Berkeley and build that strong entrepreneurship ecosystem for deep tech startups. That is, that is what the goal is. And how do we do this? We can only do this because of our fantastic board of postdocs from Berkeley and uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. We have Ajay, Sri, Teresi, Alex, they're all on the show here. Uh, but if it, it, all the credit goes to them, you know, everything behind the show is, is carried on by these folks. And I want to thank a few people, Randy Katz, the Vice Chancellor for Research who supports the program, Yvette Lynn Newton, the Director of VSPA, and all the ecosystem players like Skydeck, Baker Fellows, Citrus Foundry, uh, and on and on. Uh, so with that, let's introduce our speakers today. Uh, we have three fantastic speakers. Heather Kosinski, she's been a good friend and mentor to me for the past one year. We are working on something interesting. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Uh, but you know, she, she received a PhD from the University of Shas Shas Oh my goodness. God, Heather, I'll let you say that. <laughs> Saskatchewan. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> I practice this. Uh, <laughs> she's the co-founder and CEO of Investigen. And she was also the co-founder and chief scientific officer of Eureka Genomics, which was acquired by Affymetrix and later by Fisher Scientific. Uh, Heather is a director at large companies and mid companies as well. And she was a postdoc at UC Berkeley. That's a Cal connection. And she's very passionate about helping startups. She mentors them, uh, helps them succeed. Uh, Dave Schaefer, uh, he's a professor of chemical biomolecular uh, engineering, bioengineering, and neuroscience at University of California, Berkeley. He also serves as the director of the Berkeley Stem Cell Center and the director of QB3. Uh, he's the co-founder of and chief scientific advisor to 4D Molecular Therapeutics. He's a serial entrepreneur who has launched six startups, right, Dave? That's right. Uh, yeah, and as a part of his role at QB3, Dave has been a phenomenal mentor to early stage founders uh, and a scientist in general, you know, sitting down with them and talking them to that research and how to translate that research of startups. Fantastic, you know, he's been a great friend for the past couple of years now. And Doug, Douglas Crawford, he's a very special friend for BPEP. Uh, I don't think BPEP would exist today without <laughs> Doug. Uh, about 11 years ago, I was running around to his workshops and saw like, there was a lack of such ecosystem at Berkeley and went to him and said, like, Doug, I want to start something at Berkeley. And he said, like, don't waste your time. <laughs> 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 Go do your startup. Why are you wasting your time? Or do your research, become a professor, whatever you want to become. And, and I, I, was, I was persistent after a year or so. He's like, okay, all right. Go ahead and start it. I'm frequently wrong, Naresh. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, but he, he said something. He's like, you know, you're dealing with postdocs and grad students. They're like uptight. Uh, almost they don't want to talk to each other. Uh, so we'll throw in some beer. I'll throw in some pizza. And he made the introductions to all the first year uh, speakers. Uh, and, you know, that was the beginning. Uh, we thought nobody would come to the first workshop. 230 people showed up at the first workshop. Yeah. You know, uh, Katie Moodgard was, was the first speaker, Doug, and that was the beginning. We have about 25, 30 startups, you know, in our capabilities, that was a huge thing. 
But uh, Doug is, is the managing partner of Vision Bio Capital and has overseen the investments in 52 companies. 11 of them have already seen liquidity events. Uh, he serves on the boards of several startup companies and he also created MPC Bio Labs. Um, in the first six years, this program has helped 210 companies. That is phenomenal. Uh, that have brought in 53 programs to the clinic. That, that is outstanding and have raised more than $4.75 billion. Uh, so and there's a lot we can talk about, Doug, uh, but we'll learn more about it during this conversation. All right, let's jump into this uh, topic of psychology of deep tech startups. Uh, it, for each of you, Heather, maybe you can start off. Yeah. Talk about the formative experiences that shaped your startup years. You know, I know you started as a faculty, uh, and what happened in those early years and why did you, and how did you become an entrepreneur? Well, and so my entrepreneur journey began about 1995, before there was a lot of support and a lot of programs and a lot of, you know, that's, my goodness, that's like 25 years ago, isn't it? It's a long time ago. Um, I had been a professor at the University of Saskatchewan up in Canada in the Midwest, north of North Dakota and Montana. And uh, about four months into that, went to my department head and told him I really needed to have a sabbatical now because I was getting um, inundated with the requests to be the female on every single committee, being the second hire in the College of Agriculture, the first one being six months earlier than I was. And it was, I wasn't getting my lab set up. I wasn't doing all of those things to get tenure. And so I said, yeah, I, I need a sabbatical. And I've, um, I had opportunities from a number of places and I actually um, came to Berkeley as a postdoc, and I I turned I turned down the Science City in Japan. I turned down MIT. I turned down Zurich, and I came to Cal because Cal was the only one that asked me when I was going through that. Just because you can do something, should you? And I thought, wow, that's everyone else was just science, science, science. Do it, do it, do it. And Cal was the only one that challenged me on just because you could, should you? And to, to think about your bigger responsibility as a scientist in, in the bigger uh, community. One of my objectives was to get a business degree because I thought running a lab was like running a business. It was writing a grant to sales and marketing. People have to finish projects on time and on budget. You want to have a brand. You want the community to know about you. You want public relations. A lab is a business. Even though many of my mentors at the time were like, uh, no, it has nothing to do with business, Heather. And I was like, no, it has, in my mind, it has everything to do with running a business. Um, so I got a business administration certificate from the Haas School of Business. And through that exercise, recognized that I would probably have more fun doing science in the context where I had more control. And maybe I should start a company. And so remember, this is this is 1995, right? I've just strong armed my department head into giving me a sabbatical after having been brought on for four months and extending that and it kind of extending that because everything was really great at Cal. And I met a guy, right? And okay, that's a different path. And now I was thinking I wanted to start a company. And I thought, this is actually about the stupidest thing you have ever thought, Heather. So just get that out of your mind and get on with your dream job of being a university professor, getting to talk about DNA every day and think about DNA. But the idea just didn't go away. And I thought, okay, well, a PhD is a license to think, break down the big problem into little problems, solve the little problems and see where you're at and spent about six months going through, okay, where would I put it? How would I get money? 
How do you even start a company? What does that mean? How do you incorporate? What, what, like what, what do you do if you have to file a patent by yourself and don't have a big institution to help you? How do you hire someone if you don't have a whole hiring? Like, how do you even do that? And at the end of the six months, the last little item there on my big list was too scared. And I thought, well, I guess I really can't be telling my grandchildren the reason I didn't do something I thought I wanted to do was because I was too scared. And so I started the first company and managed to push it through to, to be successful. And in a lot of ways, it's, it's like a PhD. You don't know what you're doing until you're in the middle of it doing it. And the next one gets easier and the next one gets easier. But for me, the courage came from, I just couldn't deal with having to tell people I was too scared to do something because I'm just stubborn like that, I guess. <laughs> That's a great story there. Uh, Dave, uh, did you choose the faculty path first or the entrepreneurship path first? Like you can go into the same topic of formative years of you ending up at a startup. Faculty first, but with the vague intention. Um, so, you know, I came from a family that did a lot of biomedical work research. Uh, so my father was a very, very basic scientist, you know, the kind of person you'd find an MCB at Berkeley 20 years ago or so. He was a biochemist, retired now. Uh, my mother did drug development uh, for, for uh, Novartis and, and Sanofi, you know, ran clinical trials. And my sister, who was a Cal grad, uh, is a practicing physician, a pediatrician. And so I, you know, everybody has to try to find what, what uh, you know, engages them the most. And what engaged me was to be somewhere in between. You know, I didn't want to be as basic as my father. I wanted to be creating technologies that perhaps someday, you know, somebody like my mom might take into the clinic and somebody like my sister might prescribe. So I wanted to be at that interface of the basic and the translational. And I uh, got to Cal 22 years ago, I uh, became a professor in, in chemical engineering, the only person doing health research at the time within that department. We didn't have a bio department at, uh, just yet. And started, you know, trying to solve problems uh, where, you know, problems that could potentially have a, an impact in healthcare. Uh, I entered into this field of gene therapy and cell therapy, which, to be honest, were backwaters for the first 10 years of my career. People thought people are doing gene therapy research. That's a thing still. And then, um, you know, the stars started to align uh, where the technology began to work. And so we started licensing some technology to other companies. And at some point along the way, I started thinking, well, wouldn't it be kind of fun to play direct role and actually taking it over the fence and, and translating it into industry? Didn't quite know how to do that. And then uh, started my first company 2011 or so. It's still around, it's still growing. But then this, the, uh, the second company, which, is, uh, which was 4D, you mentioned in the intro, uh, ended up meeting a colleague at a, at a QB3 event. Uh, thank you, Doug. And uh, <laughs> two of us kind of hit it off and started to work together. And that's what, you know, became 4D when we spun it out of the university. And so as Heather mentioned, you know, the first one um, took a lot of effort. The second one, a bit easier, especially since we had uh, some expertise at, you know, kind of both ends of the spectrum from science all the way through business. And then uh, from there, I really caught a bug. It just ended up being a lot of fun to, to not license, but to actually start the company on your own. And uh, this is something I can see myself doing for many years to come now. Great, thank you for that. And I just want to plug in something that in academia, a lot of grad students and postdocs are raised to be a, a faculty. Uh, what I've been observing of late is like a lot of faculty like yourself are taking those things in their own hands, the research and translating into a startup. So, you know, you don't have to leave your you know, postdoc or a faculty job completely, but you can still be a faculty and start companies. Uh, you know, you have that support from the ecosystem uh, to help you go and get there. This is just for the colleagues on, on, on the call. Uh, Doug, uh, you're a startup for startups. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good way of putting it. But before, before I launch into my uh, that history, I should say I first met Dave maybe 15, 16 years ago. And it, it somehow it like a uh, face bomb moment. He said, you know, I'm only gene therapy <laughs> can really uh, cure disease. Everything else that we're doing in you know UCSF in Berkeley that is disease related is mostly trying to ameliorate the downward spiral of a uncurable disease. And I thought, wow, that's so cool. And he made the shocking 
observation that he was one of one, one of two people working on gene therapy at that point within the combined institutions of UCSF and Berkeley. So I've always greatly admired Dave's work, and uh, and thank goodness <laughs> he uh, persevered, and it's now bearing such great fruit. So I, um, yeah, so my my interest in this emerged uh, in the mid 2000s, as I was saying before we began. You know, UCSF, which was where the institution, both where I did my graduate work and where I was working at the time, it was getting three quarters of a billion dollars a year in financing and only creating two to four companies a year in the mid two thousands, and the and I wasn't really concerned with the economic loss associated with all those companies who weren't created, but no therapy can reach a patient without a company in between. There has to be somebody that does the hard slog to turn a very promising science into a product that can serve patients. And big companies are rarely doing that. It's very rare to see products licensed directly out of the university by pharma to, and to make that journey. So we needed startups if we were going to make the academic inter enterprise really an agent of change for patients. And so um, we contemplated an incubator uh, to be able to you know, grease the skids to help that out. I have to confess, we went around and we asked every smart person we could think of, all the venture capitalists on Sand Hill Road, and 100% of them told us it was a terrible idea. They said all we would do is create an intensive care unit for little companies. And so we did what, what all good entrepreneurs do, which is we sought expert advice and then we totally ignored it. Um, so we uh, went ahead and opened this tiny uh, little incubator in the, QB3, in the QB3 building at the UCSF campus. Six companies moved in, all of them unfunded, freshly minted graduate students and postdocs. And we ran the experiment. And within two years, four of those companies had closed substantial venture financing rounds, and a fifth was acquired by Appymetrics for $25 million right out of the lab. And $25 million may not even get a mention in Fierce Biotech today, but that entrepreneur still owned probably 85 or 90% of the company, so it was a very good day for him. And it was a great endpoint for the uh, technology. So then we continued down that path. Uh, we have now have three buildings. We just bought another building in San Francisco. We're just about to build a 95,000 square foot building in San Carlos. We have 104 companies today. We'll have 250 in a, by 2024. And we continue to try to lower the impediments between the great science that's occurring in the academic institutions and the realization of a successful company and ultimately benefit to patients. So it's been a great, a very gratifying journey over the last 15 years or so. That is such a fascinating story. And while we're on the subject, we'll go on a different thread. Uh, how about the venture fund you raised, Mission by, if yeah. you want to talk into that, yeah. and how you ended up becoming a venture capitalist. Yeah, <laughs> so I often... I often tell people that I begin my relationships with startups with a halo, right? You know, without the one bench at a time that we can rent them, many of the companies that begin life with us wouldn't exist. And then later they see the horns emerge <laughs> of my venture capital side. Originally we started that uh, with an $11 million fund associated with the university that uh, whose purpose was really trying to, again, prime the pump to help the companies get more capital. And that fund has done wildly well. It's included companies like um, Zymergen and, and Caribou are in uh, fund one for us. We've subsequently raised four more funds. We just finished closing our fifth fund. We've uh, grown quite a bit since then. We just closed a $275 million fund. Uh, but always um, the fund is just another way of accelerating entrepreneurial success. I mean, it's, 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 it's trying to provide uh, fuel to keep the companies progressing forward. But the, the, labs are, the labs are where we begin our relationships and then we judiciously apply capital to companies that really need it to really get going bigger and faster. Yeah, that, that's like a full circle. In mid 2000, you're going to VCs, 
trying to raise some money for the incubator. They call them ICUs for startups. <laughs> and now biology is eating the world. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, for many years, uh, you know, the tech industry looked down their nose at us and now we can stand tall and proud. You know, they're all lining up for our vaccines that our companies are helping make. So, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and that's a good segue. Let's stick to first principles here because a lot of the audience are grad students and postdocs trying to start companies. Uh, Heather, if you want to start, if you can walk me through the decision process when you first started to start a company, what was the decision, pro decision process like? Who did you talk to? And how, you know, what is the technology you're looking at? And how did you take that leap of faith? Well, so you got to remember, this was a long time ago, yes. and there were no real role models about how you would go about th to do this. Um, especially female role model. Well, especially female non non citizen wanting to do it, right? Yeah. Um, and so a big part, and would have to tell my full time my sabbatical back in Canada that I was not going to come back. I was essentially quitting that job. And I wasn't going to be able to stay on as a postdoc at Cal. So I was going into the unknown with no salary, no guarantee, no anything. And so it was a fairly intense conversation with the new husband. I mean, we'd had a relationship leading up to that. But <laughs> that uh, who was also very excited about it but that one of us had to not be involved. One of us had to have a job that would pay the mortgage and have health insurance. And if when we had children, be a little more flexible and, and able to, um, at no notice, be at home because a, a child was sick or had, there had been an accident and, and had to respond. and untraditionally that would not be me then that would be him and he is often the he is always the unsung hero of my successes and I, I really like to highlight him because there would be no startups there would be no success without without his patience and his backing and it's, it's one thing I, I tell a lot of startups that come to me, you've got to have your spouse, your plus one, your significant other, absolutely on board with this because it is, it is going to be stressful. It is going to be challenging, especially if you're stepping off into the unknown and giving up a paycheck and solely relying them on them. And so that was probably the hardest conversation. All of the other, most of the other aspects of it were tractable. They were things that needed to be solved, but I felt they were solvable. Okay. How do you get money? You know, you, okay. You said, you know, you get investments, you have angels, you do this. What's your product going to be? Well, okay. Instead of being necessarily a technology looking for a fit, what is a need that you can fill with technologies you can have access to, or you can invent yourself. So those were much more more tractable, but it was really the making sure the plus one was behind it as much as I was. Otherwise, it wouldn't have happened. So there are men behind behind women, successful women too. <laughs> we, we hear about women behind successful men. Uh, so this is a good story. Uh, Dave, how about yourself? You mean, how did I uh, sort of yeah, talk address what the, was going on? My yeah, person? the decision, the decision process, like how did you jump and like what are the tough decisions you had to take? You know, mm -hmm. yeah, it's. I mean, it comes down to time, right? Uh, you can, <laughs> you can always uh, try to to raise more money, but there's only so much time in your day, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then it becomes a prioritization of how to spend it and how to balance it. Um, I have two kids whom I uh, absolutely adore. Um, I'm gonna have to go off of video in about 20 minutes to pick one of them up at soccer. <laughs> I'll be there the whole time, but sorry, I'd be off video. And, uh, you know, I, I had a, you know, a family that uh, I was trying to take care of um, and were taking care of me as well. 
And, um, you know, I had my day job at Berkeley. And so it's, it's all a matter of like, how do you squeeze more seconds out of the day? And became absolutely as, as efficient as I possibly could, gave up a couple hours of sleep a night and, uh, you know, did that day in, day out, um, was up five, 5.30 doing emails on Saturday and Sunday mornings for years. Um, and, you know, it accumulates enough and you build up enough time that you can, you know, get some things accomplished outside of, outside of your day job and outside of your family. So I, uh, of course it was, uh, um, tough and lots of moments of my eyes drooping, but absolutely <laughs> worth it. And I would do it again in a heartbeat. Appreciate sharing that. And Doug, you're dealing with a lot more uncertainty because it's just not you. You're dealing with the uncertainty of other startups as well. How did you jump into this? So I think the, the thing I try to reassure entrepreneurs with is that um, uh, there is no decision that they'll make regarding a startup is irreversible. So uh, for postdocs and graduate students in the university, often there's a tension between why I had always wanted to be a faculty member. And if I leave that to go be a startup, to be an entrepreneur, am I closing that door? And we've had a couple of cases where people have come and created companies and then gotten jobs. There's a wonderful story of a faculty member now at UCSF who was a graduate student at UCSF, started a company, ran that company for several years, and then is now a faculty member at UCSF. So there's no just do it. There's really no reason to be anxious about it. And then w what our labs have tried to do is to make that so affordable that you can self-fund the company. I know that's a, it seems inconceivable, but we can get you going in the lab for less than a studio apartment in San Francisco. So my partner, Robert Blaché, he self-funded the company for a year. A woman today just sold her company uh, who had been in our labs for, gosh, it must be almost two years now, self-funded it the entire time. And, um, you know, in a single bench, one woman going there, and today she sold the company. And it's like, wow, that is so fabulous to see, to see that. That is it such is, a, it's, yeah. it's a, it's a tough choice. Um, and I don't have any magic wands to help. Let me give you one last story. For 10 years, I've been trying to persuade my wife to start a company. It took me 10 years, and she finally became a resident in our San Carlos. Uh, congratulations on that. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, a great story. Yeah. Yeah, the one thing we try to tell grad students and postdocs on campus is like, you know, I know you're trying to go for that second postdoc or the third postdoc. So spend, spend a year or two at a startup. See, see what all you can learn. Uh, I, I'm a first-hand experience. I can tell, you know, I left drug delivery, RNA delivery, and then jumped into a hardware startup, disinfecting PPEs and medical devices. Uh, I had a phenomenally su supportive wife uh, who took care of me for seven years. And so I think I go back to Heather that your spouse support is going to be super important. Make sure you have it in writing that, you know, but explaining the, to the spouse that these are, this is what the hardships are going to look like. I think be very clear and real about this. There's no uh, sugar coating about that. Uh, but but uh, I think if you don't want to start your own company, at least go work for a phenomenal founder. Uh, again, because it's early stage. We talk to Dave Schaefer about this all the time. Dave, you'll be putting on multiple hats. Uh, he, Dave, was, he, Dave was the auditor, Dave was the accountant, Dave was the scientist. You're going to learn a lot on, on the job. So uh, you know, that, that's a great point. Uh, you, know, you know, because I'm trying to keep it simple, you know, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty and stress. How did each of you deal with it? Maybe you, you can go with it, Doug. And, you know, it's just not an abstract question. You know, what are the things that they could potentially do? If you start a company, what are the things you've seen as, as a common factor for most startups? And how did founders deal with it? And, and talk about the ecosystem support. Yeah, so I mean, uh, I just told you a story about a woman who did it all by herself, and that is not a path I'd recommend. I think the very first person you should sell the company to is your spouse or partner, but then the second person is going to be your partner in the company, and it's, mm -hmm. it's so much more uh, rewarding and likely to succeed and if you can do it with at least one other person, and a team is even better. 
the next step is a, is uh, has been a really critical piece of why incubators succeed is that starting a company is a roller coaster ride and there are not all days are great days and there are stresses around raising capital and the like um, but if you do that in 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 a community of other entrepreneurs who are going through similar experiences you will feel energized by them and your lows will be much shallower than they would be otherwise the highs remain just as high but the lows get um, get moderated so i would do do it with a with somebody else do it with a partner um join a partner uh, and then second i do it in a community of like-minded people and that will make it much more fun yeah that that, that was great advice and i think i did that mistake i i founded the company by myself and i had a couple of engineers start and one went to facebook the other went to bosch it, it's hard to keep those things so selling to your partner in the company is going to be really important. You got to be a good salesperson for that. Uh, There's a great video, how to create a movement. Have you seen that? No. <laughs> there's, there's this guy off on the side dancing at a rock concert and someone else comes over and that second person and then stimulates everybody else to join them. And so <laughs> we all celebrate the founder, the original, the idea maker. But without that second person, they're just a crazy person off at the side. <laughs> when you have a team, then you have a movement. You need a bunch of crazies, not one. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, uh, yeah, thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I completely echo Doug's comments. Um, I think that, uh, you know, there's, there's kind of a saying that you can't pick your family, you can pick your co-founders. And it's really important to be able to pick the right people. And so I've, you know, I've been very lucky to be part of a, a number of very healthy, outgoing, you know, happy co-founding team members. And uh, because those are the folks that you're going to be in the trenches with, those are the folks you're going to talk to endlessly. Um, I've been fortunate that each of the companies I've started has actually had a former graduate student or postdoc of mine who's um, really been a, you know, a driver and a mover and a shaker in the company. And I knew them beforehand and we already had a really good relationship going into it. And then uh, we've been able to add additional team members that have been you know, terrific. Communication is, is extremely important. Um, for some companies, I've actually you know, almost set up like an afternoon phone call, like four o'clock, we were just gonna talk every day, you know, kind of like it was your mom, right? Um, or your spouse. So um, I think building strong relationships and having close knit communication um, over extended periods of time has, has been a critical so that everybody's on the same page as you go through those bumps that are inevit inevitably going to show up in the road in front of you. And we have incubated too. Um, since I had a day job, I didn't spend as much time in, in the incubator on site. Um, but uh, three, uh, one, two, three, four of my companies have actually started out in QB3 incubators. Um, three on, on the Berkeley side of the Bay and the QB3 garage, one at uh, QB, QB3 953, which is now NBC, uh, Doug's building. And uh, so those uh, ended up being really healthy communities that, that we benefited from. Again, thank you, Doug. And uh, I know, you know, from, from speaking with the co-founders, the ones who were really on the ground um, day to day in the incubator, um, that all the relationships they built and the support network they had around them was also critically important to be able to get them through the bumps. Thank you for that. Yeah, Heather, thoughts on that? Well, I would, I would pull it back to perhaps how much support you can also and energy you can get from your family. And for me, I found that it was um, quite critical to maintain the trust of my children that they would know that they were still the center of my life and, and meant everything to me. And this, this thing I did wasn't more important than they were. And so there's two, maybe three things that I, that I fairly strictly employed to be able to do that. And one was when I got home at the end of the day till their bedtime, I was all theirs. 
I wouldn't sneak off to take a phone call or to do something. Everybody knew it didn't matter if the building was burning down because I couldn't do anything if the building was burning down. There was absolutely <laughs> nothing that needed my attention when I got home. And if work needed to be at work, needed my attention, then I just wouldn't go home. But when I was at home in the evening, I was 100% there for the kids with they and they just because they really didn't have a lot of tolerance for me working when I was supposed to be with them. They were okay with me working crazy hours, but they weren't okay with me taking up some of their time that they viewed as their time. And when I was with them, I was with them. And I think that's, that's probably a lot harder with COVID and work from home and this, because I was able to really separate it. Um, and the other th sort of the, the commitment to that, if, if I had meetings on the, on the East Coast, there was a group of us you know, we would laugh, we would be hotel jet blew out and hotel jet blew back because we would red eye out, we would red eye back. And all of the other people on the team would be, well, why don't you just come and you know, you could fly in. I'm like, well, no, because I don't want to miss the time with the kids. And so I can go to the airport once they're in bed, and I can have my whole happily I sleep well so I can do this I can have my whole day of meetings in wherever Boston or DC and I can fly home and I can be with them for breakfast and they only miss me for one day of their life and and I do that by choice but I also learned that I would have to and this might sound terrible deceive them because they did not understand um the planes late, the planes delayed. They did understand mom said she was going to be home at six o'clock for dinner and now she's not home and what is going on. And so I would try and fly in. Like if I was just, you know, up and down the West coast, I would try and fly in. So maybe I'd be landing at six or seven, but I would tell them I wasn't going to be home until the next morning so that I could absolutely be sure that when they woke up, I would be there to see them and they never had to understand something came up that was more important than they did. And so, and that's, you know, has been really a wonderful relationship with them and given me a lot of strengths and a lot of benefits that are outside of the, the camaraderie and wonderfulness of, of making your own company prioritizing ruthlessly. I think that is something entrepreneurs definitely have to learn because everybody will pull you towards their own problems. Uh, this, as Dave said, there's limited time and 24 hours a day, uh, ruthlessly prioritize. And speaking of Dave, you brought up a, an important point about networking. Uh, it's like professional development. People wait till they graduate to think about professional development. And it's the same thing with networking. And I just want to get your thoughts on, you know, what are the things these, you know, if you're starting or thinking of company or even otherwise, advice on networking, you know, it's like network like crazy is, is my mantra because you're going to need people, uh, you, you need help as you grow. Uh, Dave, you want to start off first? Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, this is something that you, you know, absolutely appreciate even more so as time goes on, you know. I went to MIT as a graduate student, so perhaps I was a little handicapped when it came to socializing. But uh, you know, as time goes on, you begin <laughs> to recognize and realize that you, you know part of the value that that you have uh, from your you know professional progress is your network, and it's the you know the people you can call on, and you know part of that value is is joyful that you you know we obviously care very much about our careers and our, our professional development and so we spend a lot of time working and the people that we work with become our friends right and so being spending time with people and caring for relationships and staying in touch with people is something that's actually personally fulfilling and then in addition it becomes professionally really important because uh as, as time goes on you know if you have a company that's facing a challenge, or if you're trying to mentor a company that's facing a challenge, 
reaching out into your network uh, to be able to find that person who has the expertise uh, to be able to help you solve your problem or help you solve the problem that the company you're trying to help out is, you know, that's, that's incredibly valuable. So the people you know, of course, end up uh, playing a significant role in successes in life. And the idea is that, you know, more time that goes by, the more people you meet and the larger your network should become. And so that's something that should be fostered and cared for. Yeah, I, I just want to add one thing to that. You know, relation building is not a transaction. You know, it, it's not, be, don't network because you're expecting something from people. I think it's like a give and take. It, it's like a relation building, like just like with the kids and stuff, you know, give, uh, you know, don't expect anything. Like Doug does it all the time. Like, uh, and, and keep that in mind. And I'm going to shamelessly plug in my podcast uh, lab to start up uh, because we talked about some of the networking issues uh, with Dave Schaefer and David Kern from 4D. Uh, it's going to be out in a couple of weeks, but check it out. Sorry. And Doug, uh, your thoughts on that networking? Like, who, who, who did it best? Uh, and uh, uh, what are the best well, you're, practices? <laughs> you're one of the best, I'd say. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a hallmark of all good entrepreneurs, even in the shy ones, is to overcome that. In fact, I'll, I'll give you a secret, which is when we're evaluating entrepreneurs for an investment, we have a hidden checklist that we use. And we think you know, beyond technical expertise, the human qualities that we look for the most are that they are uh, magnets for people, magnets for money, and they stay focused on the most important uh, thing to do at a time. And that seems trivial. Like, sure, I get up every morning, I write down the most important things that I would do with the most, I do the thing top on that list. Very few of us do that. And being able to discern the um, most important trees in a very dense forest is a really uh, hard art form. But the first one and the one relevant to networking is the most successful entrepreneurs somehow just gather people or magnetically gather people to them. People want to work with them, advise them, talk to them. And um, I think you make a really great point, which is though you don't want to be transactional, you don't want to be extractive before you are a giver. You know, you, you um, should be generous in spirit. Fantastic point. I think Silicon Valley is Silicon Valley because of that characteristic. I don't think yeah. you see that anywhere else at this level that people exactly. are just willing to give. Uh, it's yeah. been happening from the beginning uh, and it continues. And unless somebody catches up to that, we are way, way ahead of everybody else. Uh, yeah. Heather, thoughts on networking. What have you done? I just, I mean, there's not much to add. It's, it's everyone's... Um, hidden superpower isn't it what that that um the that rolodex that that buoys you up and and gets you through when you're like this <laughs> um because you've been there for them right i mean and and you might not have been there for them in a big way but you've been there for them there's, there's a saying i heard the other day of of a family that had wealth and and the neighbors moved in and and they didn't and the mom went over from the the family with wealth and asked for um this she, she was making cookies and she needed a, a teaspoon of salt and her son asked her well why did you do we got we got salt right here why did you do that mom and she said well because I know that they will need to ask us for something. And if I've asked them for something first, they will feel easier about asking me for something. And so, you know, while it's, it's not transactional in nature, um, you also have to be able to receive. And sometimes you have to set up scenarios where you are able to give. Such a good story. Such a good story. And I want to take a small break from asking questions and open up the floor. Uh, if anybody wants to jump in with comments and questions, uh, please, the mic is open. Don't feel shy. Naresh, one thing that we from other parts of the world always think that uh, for people to start businesses in the 
in the Silicon Valley, it's easy because there are all these angels and investors and everything. I wanted to know uh, how was the beginning of your uh, companies and, and how much of it you, you bootstrapped and how much of it you depended on other people's uh, money? Wants to take it? Heather? Well, uh, sorry, go ahead, Dave. I was going to say, I, I really do uh, lament the fact that um, the entrepreneurship is very unevenly distributed around the world. Our um, sample within UCSF, where, where only two to four companies a year were being created, and now there are dozens every year, is that just think of what that would mean to the human potential, to human achievement, if we could, if we could do that same thing everywhere. And it's so much easier here because we do have that concentration of capital, both human and financial capital, experience, team members. Um, and I think that's a major challenge for, for all of us in, to, to remove the barriers that exist. I think if we can lower the cost to get data, that's really what, what the incubators do, is they lower the cost to get data because in our industry it's data that drives the next step. You need money to get data, you need data to get money. If you can lower the cost to get that data it would be really helpful. And then somehow we should build like this international connections that can allow great data to shine in a, as many corners of the world as possible. But I think it's a great question. And I think that, uh, as Doug mentioned, there are a lot of companies growing up in our ecosystems now. Uh, there's a lot of, of funds, but there's a lot of competition as well. And so you do see some of the young companies, you know, from first time entrepreneurs uh, having some challenges in some cases, being able to, you know, to make it over the hump of that first financing. And so there have been, you know, support systems that have been growing along with that. I think NBC was really a leader. Um, and there has been a you know, small proliferation of campus affiliated shared carry uh, funds. And some of them are doing great service to, to new entrepreneurs. Uh, even though they might be a minority investor, uh, I've seen some of them actually take the role of being lead. And so they're putting in a lot of the work, a lot of the hours to do DD and close that deal as a service, you know, for the university and for those young entrepreneurs. Uh, so that's, that's been terrific to see as well. And then, you know, for serial entrepreneurs, it can get slightly easier in some ways. You know, there's some um, benefits in the U.S. tax code that you can take the proceeds of one business and put it into the next, kind of like you do the same thing for a house, right? You can take a certain number of dollars on the capital gains in the sale of one house and put it into the next house, uh, capital gains tax-free. So I've seen that increasingly as well as a pattern that once somebody ends up um, having a first successful exit, they become their own angel investor uh, in the next rounds of companies. I think one of the things that can make it harder in other locations is 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 sometimes there's there's not an understanding of risk to the same area that there is in places the Bay Area, San Diego, Boston that that have have it's it's more of the common language that uh, in other locations, and maybe it's too big a word, but in other cultures, and I, I speak of this from the Midwest of Canada, there's plenty of ideas. There's people that would put money into those ideas, but the people with the ideas are, oh, but I, I couldn't risk your money. It's, it's not a sure thing. I, I, I have to just do it by myself because I'm not willing to put your money at risk and and there's not that much of a as much of a barrier to that in places that have more of a culture that people more understand that conversation and that the angels the vcs have evaluated and do understand i mean they they think they've made a good decision, they've done their due diligence, they've, they've understood it. It's not gambling, but there's also um, a, a down round or a failure 
doesn't make you completely unemployable and you can't even go to the bar anymore at night. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm very optimistic though. Things are changing very rapidly. Like, you know, I, I just heard about Sequoia working with Illumina to open up an accelerator in China, fully operated in China by Sequoia and the funds are moving around the world. I think it, markets are driving these conversations. And when they see a huge market, every venture capitalist, every angel wants to go and invest. In other countries, I, in South America is exploding. Uh, and, and I think unfortunately the cost of doing, of doing research is so high at this point. Uh, I think to what Doug and, uh, and Dave and, and Heather mentioned, uh, it, it's still an expensive proposition. Those have to come down eventually. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that it'll spread around the world, that that gap is lowering. Any other questions? And Andrew made a good point. Like it's, it's okay to fail. I think that's a culturally, in, especially in the Eastern part of the world, like in India and China, like it's looked down upon, like if you fail. And I was scared. My, and my parents still think like, what is this fool doing? He has a PhD, why can't he get a job? You know, he's a failure. <laughs> that, 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 that's a taboo, it's still there. And it's hard to overcome those things. But you know, it, it's fun. Uh, I, I think I want to slightly shift the gears into like, each of you can, you know, I think Doug will have multiple stories, but talk about the fun side of starting the company. You know, it, you know I don't want to make it like a downer, like it's hard. It, it, it's a, it, life is hard. Uh, I think it is what you make out of it. And I just want to get the fun stories out of these. Uh, well, I, I'll say, you know, right, right up front, which is uh, we probably have 450 to 550 people working in our labs in startups. I've never known anyone to say, oh, I'm going to go back to a big company. <laughs> it is so much fun to be working in uh, with other people on a common problem and uh, win, lose, or draw. We've had, um, we've had entrepreneurs come back to us three times now, many two-timers, one, I think the only one three-timer, but uh, it's pretty amazing. It is the most gratifying thing you'll ever do uh, professionally. I, I would I would echo that. Um, Eureka Genomics went from um, I saw I saw that that sequence next generation sequencing was coming, and I didn't quite buy into that whole genome sequencing was what was needed. I thought people would still genotype a lot and so figured out how to make uh, next generation sequencing into just really, really um, multiplex, multi-sample genotypers. And that was is the technology called Eureka, uh, Eureka Genomics and Eureka Genotyping and is what went to Affymetrics and then Thermo Fisher. But oh my goodness, the rush you get when you have an idea that you build through all the way and then see it being sold globally is wow. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I completely agree. It, it, it just goes back to more basic things like as postdocs and PhD grad students, we do so much research. I think there's so much gratification in actually making something out of it. You know, would you rather let it die in the scientific value of death in the form of a paper publication or, or a patent and, you know, hope that somebody will do something with it? But, but that, you know, you taking that idea, the research that you put your lifeblood into four, five, 10 years, how much ever, and making a product, uh, I think that is phenomenal. Uh, Dave, thoughts? I don't, I don't know if you got the question. Yeah. Uh, we're trying to get the oh, fun, did, yeah. fun side. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the, the joys has really been my, my, you know, junior partner entrepreneurs, you know, the, the younger folks. Uh, I remember the very first time that, you know, yeah, when you're an assistant professor, you have basically an account number and an empty room, right? And you're trying to build a, trying to build a lab. And I remember the first time I convinced a couple of graduate students when I was starting out to join my lab, all of a sudden I had this moment, a slight panic attack of, oh my God, I am now responsible for these, these kids' <laughs> education and their career. And I've been incredibly uh, awed by how 
you know, first of all, how much faith they can have. And the second is how entrepreneurial, how risk taking they are, that uh, they are willing to, you know, kind of step off a cliff and jump into something that they've never done before. Uh, because they, you know, have a belief and a curiosity and an interest and, and a, a drive and, and have some risk taking inside of them. So uh, they have, you know, provided me with a lot of energy, actually, and, and been an inspiration to me. Um, and so I, you know, a university environment is, is terrific. And I always love being associated with one and being associated with young, energetic folks and companies is every bit as joyful. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I think I want to bring up one thing. It's like the friendships you make during this process. This is a journey. It doesn't matter even if you fail, but those friendships are going to last for a long time, no matter what you do. But the other joy for me was like, even if I fail, like, you know, whatever the reasons are, is like the amount of learning, you know, for all of us who are like scientists and engineers, you know, what drove us was curiosity. And what will drive you through the process of startup journey is that curiosity to learn how to solve their problems together with other people. That is the most fun thing. You know, I'll do that again. Uh, so I just want to, you know, let everybody give it a shot, you know. Uh, well, I, right. I, would, I would put one thing in there that, that can help with sort of the, ooh, fear, what am I doing? Um, and, and thank you, Dave, because you reminded me of this is you can think back to when maybe you signed your first one year lease on an apartment, right? And you're like, oh my goodness, what have I just <laughs> done? Or you bought your first car and suddenly had car payments to make, or, or you signed on that mortgage thing and that was a huge payment. You get through it, right? You, those, you don't know at the start of any of those things how you're going to do that. But you do know other people have done it. There's people you can talk through. You can get through it. And so there, there can be that fear. And it was just, Dave, you know, when you hire your first employee and it's like, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. I'm now responsible for this person's paycheck. Holy <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's, these, are, these are fun stories, you know, so give, give it a shot, everybody and anybody. Uh, I, I'll open up the floor again for questions, you know, this is a conversation, this is for all. Daresh, I think that there are a few questions in the chat, if you want to have a look at. Yeah, while I'm looking at that, please uh, feel free to jump in with questions. Somebody, uh, Navid asks, will I move to Arizona from California hurt to start a company? <laughs> well, I have a um, I have a parochial view of that. Uh, we just welcomed a company that moved from St. Louis to um, to our labs, and and their feeling was the sort of if I can make it there, I can make it anywhere. That <laughs> that all the tools are here, the competition is fiercer, but the resources are here, and um, but I. I don't mean to say that we have a lock on it, but I'm not, I don't think the differential in costs associated with operating in another state will matter nearly as much as the people. And so if you can find great people there, go for it. Yeah, I'll say that the financing side of it has gotten a little bit easier remotely. Mm -hmm. um, you know, COVID of course is, uh, led to a situation where lots of people are working remotely. And, um, you know, there are two, I guess, sides of the company. One, of course, is, is uh, building value in the lab and, and in the clinic. And that involves being, you know, in person. And uh, as a result, your microenvironment, you know, the people you interact with on a day-to-day -day basis are incredibly important. And whether that niche be in the Bay Area or in Arizona, as long as you build a good one and a good community, that's terrific. But the financing side of it has gotten a bit easier remotely. Uh, I was lucky enough to, um, we, I uh, participated, we ran a, um, an IPO last December. And so I participated in all the testing the waters meetings and then the roadshow meetings and had 75 investor meetings over about a uh, two month stretch. And, you know, from the comfort of my, of my bedroom. <laughs> so that just would not, not have been possible if it were a traditional in-person roadshow. Uh, you know, you, you just can't do that. Can't get on enough trains, planes, and automobiles to do that within a compressed time frame. 
Great point. Let, let me ask a follow-up question. Uh, you know, in general, the Bay Area is expensive to live at the cost of living. And if, if we take that point and go down, uh, like scaling a company, is it, once you establish the technology and when it comes to company building, has it been easier to build the companies uh, in other parts of the country uh, where there could be more talent as well? Uh, what, what are your observations on that? You know, RTP comes and says like, oh, Research Triangle Park, uh, we have a great ecosystem here, come down and build companies. Like, what worked and what did not? Any observations? Maybe we'll start with Doug. Well, I have a I have a view on it. It's it's a controversial one that may be wrong, but you know, there were twenty some years ago there was a, a book called The World Is Flat, and, yeah. and and the thesis was that the internet would 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 remove the um, preference for geography, and we would find human capital wherever it resided in the world. And what did we find happened in the twenty twenty five years since the book was written? Is actually the centers of innovation have gotten hyper concentrated and hyper local. And so, um, you know, in the United States, it's really a very small handful of cities. Probably Boston and, Boston, and yeah. the Bay Area represent 60% of the venture capital dollars spent in the United States each year. Um, and it, so it's, I, I think it's hard to compete with the, network effect of these um, these epicenters. And the cost of living is kind of a reflection of that. It's not a, yeah. <laughs> so I think, I think you can, if you can make it here, come. <laughs> well, and it, and it extends really past to the, the VC dollars. It's the, the quality of the people you can attract to come on the journey with you and, that esoteric skill set and passion combination that you need to get you to that next zero to one event event you're likely to find in not very many places but here is one of them i think it goes back to uh doug's point earlier you know i think you need other crazies and you found a lot of crazies here in the bay area to help you build those companies and uh, that's why we still stay strong here. Uh, yeah, any questions? Any, and are there topics that we, sh that we should talk about, uh, Heather, Doug, and David, uh, and that you know, people should know if they're considering startups? That I missed to ask, yeah. Well, one, one thing to, if you're considering startups is to really ask that question of, well, what are you gonna, and I think, Doug and Naresh alluded to it as well. Well, what are you going to do if you don't join that startup? If, if you don't start your own startup? What, what is the realistic alternative path that you're going to go on? And as Doug said, that path probably isn't closed because you go on the startup journey. I mean, don't go on an ICU startup journey and, and figure <laughs> out 10 years later that it's not working out. But if you go on that journey and, and because you're having those thoughts and considering it, I mean, it's, it's in some ways, it's, it's like two job offers, right? There's, there's pros, cons, what you do, what you don't do. And, but the one thing you have to do is really fully commit. Even if you're in Dave's situation and you still have a day job, you have got to understand it is going to be five in the morning on Saturdays and Sundays, and even Thursdays and Fridays, probably answering the emails. It is, you're going to be giving up your coffee with your friends on Monday morning or whatever, you've got to commit. Well, I'll probably I'll, I'll take, I want to go down a different path. You know, it, maybe not everybody's in a state to start a launch a company. You know, maybe it's immigration status or whatever. Uh, you know, thoughts on joining a startup company. You know, you don't have, there'll be a lot to learn at other startups. Uh, what, have, what have your observations been and 
Well, I think I said that, Naresh, whether you yeah. join a startup yeah. yes. or start your own, yeah. you know, it's it's not a, then you can never go back to that other thing. But if you go on that startup journey, be it as joining one, as an early hire, being joining it as a co-founder, being starting it yourself, you just have to really commit because it's going to be harder than you think it is. And the grass is going to be greener on the other side. <laughs> what I, I, I saw this recently, grass is greener where you water it. <laughs> I was trying to reframe this, like, you know, maybe joining a startup is a, is, or a company is a good idea before you launch one. Some people say that, like you know, we hear Mark Anderson and some others say that, uh, but thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, I, ju I just, I don't think we should, uh, well, <laughs> you know, there's all sorts of motivations that drive people to do this. Some people have a um, have a burning passion to see a particular technology invention realized, mm -hmm. and they are driven by by that technology. Uh, many many successful companies built that way. Many unsuccessful companies built that way. Um, but in terms of you know career, the pastime, the ability, you're just as likely to find success working with someone else as, as to do it yourself. Because very few companies stay singularly focused on what they started with. Most companies end up morphing, amalgamating, or pivoting altogether into something uh, different than what they originally thought they would do. What percentage in your observations have done that? Pivoting or morphing into something else. Well, it's um, a striking fact. I mean, we, 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 I wish we could take a poll of the audience, but we have 104 companies right now. At the end of the year, what fraction of that sample will still be viable, will still be busy working away? And I think most people would say in the traditional failure rates for startups, I don't know, maybe 20% would be gone at the end of the year. Years pass between when we see abject failures in our labs. I mean, there hasn't been one in the last two years. We haven't had a single startup go legs up in the last two years. That doesn't mean they're all doing the same th thing they were doing on day one. There's been a ton of learning that's occurred along the way. Not all of it is failure turn. Some of it is serendipity occurs turn. And so let's chase success here since it's going really well there, which we didn't anticipate. Um, you know, Colleen Cutcliffe, who created a company now called Pendulum, is a beautiful example of that. Um, got started with a very vague idea of what they were going to do, not, um, not unlike Heather's. They were from PacBio. And they said, God, we got to find a cool use of this platform. What can we do? And they said, hmm, bacteria. That's a good place where the long read lengths could be really useful. And wh what are they doing today? They have bugs that have substantially lowered serum glucose. They've had clinical trials where they can lower glucose uh, significantly more than metformin. And so, wow. That was oh. not part of their original plan and was not a failure that drove them there. It was serendipity and serendipity. good fortune. Fantastic. That, that's a great point. And I, I think that's something that everybody should understand that most of the deep tech startups end up morphing because of serendipity or new findings, you know, either market changes or your technology changes and, and you're going to end up in morphing, but that's a phenomenal uh, observation for two years, nothing, no, no company has gone down. That's, that's a huge point. Uh, well, I, 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 I want to keep asking this question. If anybody has questions, please uh, do. But, you know, I've been coming to the top of the hour and I'll ask you for your closing comments, each of you. Uh, Heather, if you want to go first. Uh, any, any advice on, on people considering this? You know, if, if a startup is coming to you for, and, or, or a scientist comes to you for advice, uh, what would that be? Uh, if you're ready to commit, do it. Just do it. 
Just do it. They say JFDI. <laughs> <laughs> David? I, I completely agree. I think that, uh, you know, I've been really fortunate to have some brilliant graduate students and postdocs who've been invented some things that I, you know, really happy uh, have, you know, come into the world. And then the, the question becomes, if you want this to have a, a positive impact in society, you can either kind of like throw it over the fence and license it to, a, to another company and hope that things go okay. But I've, I've found it increasingly a, a lot of fun to be playing a role in that translation uh, because you get to stay in touch with that technology a bit longer. You know, at some point founders, of course, have to be able to, to you know, let it take on a life of its own and uh, let it, you know, head in, in it on its own path. But being in touch with it for a bit longer, several years longer, so that you can really enjoy seeing the process of it becoming bigger and, and getting closer to, to being able to have a, a broader impact is, has been a joy in my career. So I'd highly recommend it. I think the only thing I would add um, in the just do it category is that because of the growth in our industry, the explosive growth in our industry that's occurring, the number one problem, well, there are two huge problems facing startups today, and I can't believe these, it's really hard to find space, yes. and it's even harder to find people. And so there's a huge shortage of human capital in the uh, small, medium, and large size companies. Um, so the opportunities to just do it are so much greater today than ever before. This has been an amazing uh, conversation. Doug, Heather, Dave, thank you so much. This is a star panel <laughs> for us and we got to- And I, uh, I would just add, after you've talked to your plus one, <laughs> okay. absolutely absolutely uh, yeah yeah make sure you have a supportive spouse or i would be yes uh, hey thank you so much for your time and all the advice and we're going to post this on youtube uh yeah we'll keep in touch and maybe i'll plug this in you know heather doug and dave have always been open to giving advice you know they have you know you know we'll put up their contact details but reach out to them they're very resourceful they have a lot of experience uh, please uh, get in touch with them or come to BPAP events and, and we, we can put them in touch with you. Thank you, everybody, for attending. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much for organizing this, Naresh. Thank you so much, Doug. Very good. Bye-bye now. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, Dave. Bye. Bye.
I always loved it when it was the University Art Museum. Yeah. So is it, it's really just like weeks away from opening, I presume, Dave? It looks pretty close, actually. You know, some monitors need to go in the front lobby, and uh, we're still installing some, like, rails, glass rails around all the ramps that, that are going on the inside back and forth. But it's it's looking pretty close, actually. A bunch of furniture still needs to go in, but it's getting close. <coughs> we can do some housekeeping. Alex, you wanted me to record this a certain way. Or exactly. No, no, I was just telling, I was just going to remind you, but then I noticed yes. that you have already started recording. No, that's perfect. This, this, this will work fine. Thank you. This is working fine. Okay, yeah. good. Uh, for those of you on, on the show here, uh, Alex is from Brazil. He was a visiting scholar doing research. He was uh, part of BPEP. He went back. He's a professor, actually. Uh, he still continues to uh, support BPEP and he's making all the videos available on YouTube. Uh, so people can watch it later on. Uh, thanks. You know, Alex. even when we had the 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 face to face events, I thought that I mean, we, sometimes we had a hundred people in one of those rooms, but we thought we could have more people watching this later and and making good use of the of, of the, the you know the of ideas that and mainly in other countries in places where people do not have the same access to this kind of discussion as in the Silicon Valley. So that's why. Uh, uh, we, we, we keep doing this and it, it's great. And this is all great content and you see the YouTube channels, there are like thousands of people visiting and you know, benefiting hopefully. Uh, well, we're not YouTubers, uh, Naresh, so we don't have thousands, <laughs> but anyway, if, even if we have, you know, dozens of people, but they're the right dozen of people, so that's what matters. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. All right. We had about 50 people register uh, for this event today, uh, which, is, which is great. Like after the, during COVID is like pretty depressing. You know, you have about like 20 people, uh, 10 people show up and, you know, it was difficult times. Uh, I'm, I'm glad things are changing and we'll be hopefully having in-person events pretty soon. The, top, the topic was very funny for me because most people are scared of launching a startup, <laughs> but you still see so many people launching companies. There's something you guys are doing differently. And I think that's a story that had to go out and, and everybody on uh, here today, like please feel free to jump in with questions and comments. Uh, we just want to make this as interactive as possible. And where are you located? I'm in Boston, although I go back and forth between Boston and San Francisco. I still work for my company in South San Francisco. Oh, nice. I see Roseanne. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about 10 years of VPEP and like early days, Doug and all of the QB3 folks, they, oh my God, we used to carry ice buckets and store them in the QB3 <laughs> offices. <laughs> uh, staff has been super supportive over the years. The one thing that we can't get on Zoom is to share a beer together. Beer. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to talk about it during the introduction, but a beer made a lot of difference. Yeah. There's no virtual my, beer, right? One of my girlfriends works for a law firm and she says that, and of course, when you're a law firm, you have the budget for this. She says that the law firm sends them out the little like four or so of the little airplane size bottles and a couple of cans of mix. And that just arrives at FedEx at everyone's house all over the United States, Canada and Mexico every second Friday. And they get together and just do fine having their beer together. On <laughs> it's a brilliant idea. Yeah. I like it. All right. I think we can get started. Uh, and people will start rolling in. Uh, 